management of a crop pest. Um, I, my brief was to give a talk about the management of resistance in red-legged earth mites in WA. An overview of the talk I'm going to give is the extent of resistant red-legged earth mites, and these are red-legged earth mites that are resistant to commonly used synthetic pyrethroids, um, and showing the distribution of them in Western Australia. The second part of the talk will be to discuss management options to reduce the incidence of resistance developing on farms and also the management options that farmers with resistance are employing. And the third part of the talk will be just to give an overview of one of the um, landscape projects that we've been working on to look at the effect of landscapes on harbouring pests or beneficials. Extent of resistance in red-legged earth mite in Western Australia. This map shows the sites of red-legged earth mites that are resistant to commonly used synthetic pyrethroids. The red dots show the sites where we found resistance. The blue shows the area that we've actually surveyed. We've surveyed 170 properties between Boy Up Brook and Esperance. And to date, we found 25 sites that have red-legged earth mites that are resistant to all synthetic pyrethroids. So it's not as if um, a grower that has resistant red-legged earth mites can change between trade names or between um, chemicals that are within the synthetic pyrethroid group, meaning if you've got resistance to alpha cypermethrin, you have it to cypermethrin, bisenthrin, you have it to all, chemi all chemicals in the synthetic pyrethroid group. So to date, we've got one side of Boy Up Brook. There's 16 around Albany and seven around Esperance. What we've found is that the majority of sites tend to be in the higher rainfall areas of the state. And these tend to be under the 500 mil ISO height line. Now this could be just an indication of the fact that growers in this region do tend to spray more often. So when we did a survey, we actually asked growers for their spray history and also uh, what they were doing. Now what we found is that growers around the uppermost um, are between Jerramungup and Ravisthorpe towards that 400 mil ISO height tended not to spray very much and they also reported that they didn't have as many pest problems whereas growers under that 500 mil ISO height line reported that they tended to have more pest problems. So not just red-legged earth mites but a higher incident of other pests like weevils or even um, some of the caterpillar pests like um, cutworms. Of the growers that we've surveyed, what we found is that those under the 500 mil ISO height were more likely to have used SPs. The growers above it were less likely to have. Um, and what it really does show is that in a lot of the paddocks that we looked at, sprays had been applied. What we had anticipated was that growers with resistance would have had a long history of SP applications over the last five years. And yes, we did find that growers with resistance were in the seven plus to five to six spray range. However, we still had six growers with resistant red-legged earth mites and they were in the three to four spray range, which we weren't expecting. Um, and this spray range is also what the average um, was for the growers that we surveyed. So what we had anticipated was that high SP use regularly and over years would lead to resistance. But what we're finding is that those growers some of those growers that do have resistant red-legged earth mites, their spray regimes are not differing from growers that don't have resistance. What we found was that canola was the crop that received the highest amount of SP applications, whereas barley and followed by barley and wheat. Now canola as you all are aware, has the growing tip above the ground, so it's very susceptible to insect damage. What we found was that the majority of those spray applications were not applied against a 
pest that was present in the crop. They were being applied in case a pest was present in the crop. And growers that didn't have resistance and growers that did have resistance did apply a spray for canola. However, there were more sprays applied in growers that were in under that 500 mil ISO height than in growers that were above it. We also resurveyed a site that had resistance discovered in 2006 and we re again resurveyed it in 2009 and in 2011. Now having gone back to the same site, we just found that there was a change in the percentage of survival. Now the CESA at the University of Melbourne have done trials and found that resistance is heritable. So progeny of mites that of red legged earth mites that are resistant will also have resistance. And what we have actually found is that that resistance persists in a population between years. What we don't know is how long it will persist or even if we will ever get right mites that are resistant going back to a non-resistant stage. So this means that growers that do have resistant red-legged earth mites are very limited in their control options. They cannot use SPs to control red-legged earth mites. Um, summary, most paddocks with the resistant mites have a history of SP use. However, this SP use does not markedly differ from paddocks that don't have resistance. But resistance, once you've got it, is heritable and persists. Currently, management options for a crop in the current year that has red-legged earth mites doing damage is limited. You can only spray. Chemical control is your only option. Currently, in canola at this very moment in time, there are only two chemical groups that are registered in WA that have efficacy against red-legged earth mites pyrethroids or organophosphates and carbamates. Now, carbamates and organophosphates are all acetylcholine esterase inhibitors, so they have the same mode of action. Consequently, you've only got really got two chemical groups you can rotate between. For a resistance management package that relies on chemical control, you really need to be rotating with between chemical groups. For growers that have resistance, they are really limited to the chemicals they can use. Ganophosphates are really their only option. So to decrease resistance developing, you really need to look at decreasing the number of pyrethroid sprays, but also alternating pyrethroid sprays with organophosphate sprays, not just in the current season, but between seasons and between years. At this stage, there has been no resistance detected in the organophosphates or carbamates. However, we cannot rely on them solely for the control of red-legged earth mites. Ten years ago, we never anticipated that we'd get resistance to synthetic pyrethroids. We really need to look at other strategies to control red-legged earth mites. One way to do this is to look at the crop hosts and weed hosts of these mites. We conducted a trial at Esperance, a three-year cropping rotation trial, which had 25 plots um, by four replicates. In year one for this trial, we seeded wheat, barley, canola, pasture and lupins going in one direction. And in year two, perpendicular to year one, we seeded the same crops, barley, pasture, canola, wheat, lupins. So this meant that you got a lupin followed by a barley, a lupin on a lupin, um, those sorts of cropping rotations. And in year three, canola was seeded over the entire site. So yes, you did have some crops with a canola on a canola, um, but that meant that we were able to look at a range of cropping sequences and the pests that would be associated with them. What we found was it was really the previous year's crop that impacted on mite numbers. In years one and two, what we found was that the mites were attracted to the crops that were their preferred plant host. Um, but in year three, by having just one crop to look at, we were able to see different amounts of damage. What we found was that canola seeded after pasture had higher numbers of red-legged earth mites 
But what we also found was that canola seed after pasture had high numbers of blue oat mite and canola seeded after a cereal, especially wheat, had higher numbers of blue oat mite. This was similarly represented for Belostium mite. Canola seeded after pasture had higher numbers of Belostium mite than um, canola seeded after canola, but what we also found was that canola seeded after cereals had higher numbers of Belostium mite. Now, some people would say that the uh, cropping rotation of canola on canola, you'd have a decrease in plant numbers, and that might also reflect why we're getting lower numbers. At this time, when all the assessments were taken, the number of plants per treatment were similar. Um, diseases still hadn't taken hold. But it's important to know what pests will be present in your crop due to the previous year's cropping rotation. It's important to know what the plant hosts of the pests are. What we were finding is that people under the 500 mil ISO height reported higher numbers of Belostium mite that they were spraying for, whereas people um, near that 400 mil ISO height reported that they had hardly any problems with red-legged earth mites. And that could be an indication that it's at the extent of their range. And what we found in our samples is that people around the 400 mil ISO height line had high, a high proportion of blue oat mite in samples. It does mean that you need to be aware of what crops may harbour pests. We have currently been telling everybody that has resistance to seed canola after a cereal paddock because cereals are not the preferred host for red-legged earth mites. However, last year we had three growers that ended up having to reseed portions of their canola paddock and because they seeded canola after a cereal and what we found was that the cereal crop was weedy. So it's very clear here that you need to be aware of what weeds are also present in the crop that may harbour pests which can then carry over into the following year. However, what we're not saying is don't plant canola after pasture at all. It's, there are good agronomic reasons for planting canola after pasture, but you need to set up your paddocks in the year before. You need to look at grazing or time right to control red-legged earth mites in pasture. And it's important to note that yes, cereals can be used to suppress red-legged earth mites, but you need to be aware of what the weed burden is for the following crop. So it's very good to have good good weed control is very important for controlling pests like red-legged earth mite. We looked at the effects of landscapes on harbouring red-legged earth mites. We looked what was in remnant bushland and in the crop and we assessed the abundance of pests. What we found was that pests were more likely to be found in crops regardless of their proximity to remnant bush. In the remnant bushland, you can see that we did find some pests, but the majority were, were found on imported botany, that's your weeds. And the majority of those that were found in the weeds was red legged earth mites. You'd say, why is that important? Because when we have surveyed farmers that have resistant red legged earth mites, we have found that the mites in the weeds that are adjacent to crops um, and that can be in the remnant bush or along fence lines or along laneways. In 2010 and 2011 we looked at the spread of resistance from a property which we knew had resistance. The property in red was one that was with confirmed resistance in 2010 and we looked to see whether that resistance had spread from that property. Every cross represents weeds along a fence line or a boundary line or a laneway. But you can see that there are some red crosses that are more than two kilometres away from this property. And we suspect that that's where resistance has developed independence. What we're thinking is that, yes, you will have resistant red-legged earth mites spread from a known property, but you can also have them developing resistance independently. So we think that 
In Western Australia, we've had resistance develop between Boyup Brook and Esperance independent of wind movement. However, in some of these locations like around Albany and around Esperance, resistance properties are adjoining each other and that would suggest that there may have been some movement and we suspect that, that movement is more likely to have occurred along weeds, along fence lines, boundary fences or laneways. So in summary, we really need to look at decreasing pesticide applications in the current season but also between cropping seasons. We need to look at setting up paddocks in the year before so that we decrease the reliance on pesticides to control red-legged earth mites and acknowledgements. I'd like to acknowledge the GRDC for funding all of this research. The red-legged earth mite resistance testing was conducted in conjunction with CESAR at the University of Melbourne and the landscape design trials research was part of a national project led by Dr Nancy Shellhorn, CSIRO.